Intel didn't fall in a single moment. Its collapse, swift as it seemed, was the outcome of quiet decisions made far from Wall Street. Decisions that triggered a shift in global technology dynamics that many still haven't fully grasped. On April 12, 2025, in a Beijing office few outside the Chinese government even recognize, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology issued a directive. There were no cameras, no press releases, just language that was clinical and calm. Effective immediately, government ministries, public agencies, and state-aligned enterprises would no longer be allowed to procure chips made by American companies. But not Intel, AMD, Micron. Instantly excluded, the justification was framed around digital sovereignty and supply chain security, but the intention was sharper. With this one move, Beijing didn't just block sales, it began to surgically remove American technology from the core of its infrastructure. The reaction on the ground in China was immediate and disciplined. Procurement databases were rewritten, vendor lists were updated, contracts in motion were frozen. By sunrise the next day, key agreements, some worth billions, with firms like China Mobile and State Grid were nullified. Entire tiers of the Chinese computing ecosystem, especially those integrated with U.S. processors, were suddenly unplugged. And the first company to feel the blow wasn't just anyone, it was Intel. Intel had grown used to its role in China. Nearly 27% of its revenue in 2024 came from the Chinese market. More than $22 billion, zero cents. The company's business model relied on deep, predictable integration with Chinese telecoms, enterprise clients, and government-adjacent server vendors. So when Beijing pulled the plug, Intel didn't just lose clients, it lost the foundation of its international cash flow. Markets took less than 48 hours to respond. By the close of trading on April 14th, Intel's stock had dropped over 18%. The semiconductor-heavy ETFs that included it like SOX and SMH fell sharply, dragging the broader chip sector with them. The PHLX Semiconductor Index dropped more than 4%. Traders weren't reacting to short-term revenue loss. They were pricing in the start of a long, irreversible separation. China wasn't just shifting away from American chips, it was deleting them. But this moment didn't emerge from nowhere. The fragility had been building for over a decade. In 2011, Intel commanded an astonishing 80% of the global PC processor market. By the end of 2024, that number had dropped to just 57%, not because of external sabotage, but because of internal inertia. The company had suffered years of technical delays, struggles with 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer nodes that allowed rivals to catch up. AMD surged forward, reclaiming market share with aggressive architectural advancements. Apple and Amazon abandoned off-the-shelf chips and began designing their own. Intel, meanwhile, was still depending on an ecosystem that was beginning to age out of relevance. The company's financials reflected the decay. In early 2023, Intel posted a $2 billion, $800 million, zero cents quarterly loss. Later that year, that figure ballooned to $8 billion, zero cents. Layoffs followed. Over 2,000 employees were cut in waves. By 2024's end, the company had shed not only headcount, but pricing power. Its once commanding influence in enterprise server design, cloud infrastructure, and government procurement was shrinking fast. By the time the Chinese government made its move, Intel had already lost the insulation that once made it strategically untouchable. But this wasn't just about Intel. It wasn't even just about semiconductors. What China executed wasn't a ban, it was a model, a blueprint, a proof of concept. The message wasn't just, we don't need your chips, it was, the world doesn't either. The strategy had been building for years, but the latest internal documents made the timeline explicit. According to planning memos reviewed by Reuters, China intends to completely phase out U.S.-sourced chips from its public infrastructure, telecom networks, and power grids by December 2027, by early 2026, 80% of central government systems must be running on domestic silicon. The campaign is called Clean Silicon. It's more than a supply chain policy. It's a quiet declaration of independence. Morgan Stanley now estimates that this shift could eliminate up to $350 billion, zero cents, in revenue for U.S. chipmakers by 2027. But the economic damage isn't the most important part. 
It's the structural shift in belief that the world's second largest economy can build a functioning, competitive semiconductor stack without any reliance on the United States. And then, in September 2024, came the event that no one in Washington expected. Huawei, under intense U.S. sanctions, released its Mate 70 Pro smartphone. Inside was a 5 nanometer Kirin chip fabricated domestically by Simic. Most experts believe such a feat was impossible without access to extreme ultraviolet lithography machines, the kind only the Dutch company ASML can make. China didn't have those. But they had older, deep ultraviolet DUV systems, and they pushed them to their limits, using multi-patterning techniques, painstaking engineering, and enormous computational correction. The chip wasn't just a statement. It worked, and it sold. Huawei shipped more than 45 million Mate 70 devices in six months. Analysts were forced to admit that the Chinese ecosystem had matured in ways they hadn't anticipated. SMIC's revenue soared 47% year-over-year. Meanwhile, Intel was still struggling with yield issues in its Ohio fab and had yet to mass-produce its delayed 18A process. The success of the Mate 70 revealed something deeper. Huawei didn't need access to the latest Western tools to compete. And if Huawei could do it with smartphones, then China could do it with servers, cloud chips, and AI accelerators. A parallel supply chain was no longer speculative, by Q1 2025, more than 75% of China's strategic sectors had partially transitioned to domestic semiconductors. Telecom, aerospace, grid infrastructure, already running on chips from Huawei, SMIC, Lungsun. The state wasn't just subsidizing these companies, it was integrating them. Over $58 billion zero cents in annual government support now flows directly to domestic chip makers, and U.S. firms like Intel are being systematically removed from those procurement channels. The results are unmistakable. U.S. chip exports to China fell from 41% of total chip imports in 2021 to just 28% in 2024. Meanwhile, domestic suppliers now dominate over 55% of government computing contracts. This isn't a hypothetical transition. It's already underway. Intel's response, backed by Washington, has been immense in scale. The Chips and Science Act unlocked $52 billion, $700 million, zero cents in federal incentives. Intel is set to receive $8 billion, $500 million, zero cents in grants, and another $11 billion, zero cents in loans. Its megafab in Ohio, once hyped as Silicon Heartland, was supposed to signal a renaissance in American manufacturing, but as of 2025, construction delays and zoning bottlenecks have pushed the timeline back. The facility isn't expected to begin partial operations until late 2026, almost a year behind schedule. Meanwhile, Taiwan's TSMC is on track to begin 3 nanometer chip production in Arizona by Q3 2025. Samsung and TSMC are already building prototypes for 2 nanometer nodes. Intel's 18A process still in pre-production. The company has made temporary gains like an 8 billion 200 million dollar zero cents deal with Amazon Web Services, but analysts are skeptical. Bernstein, Goldman Sachs, and J.P. Morgan all note that Intel's losses in China projected at over $13 billion, $700 million, zero cents annually by 2027, are unlikely to be offset by domestic deals alone. Revenue may stabilize, but the innovation gap is widening. Former CEO Pat Gelsinger, now serving in an advisory role, recently said, It's not about winning a quarter. It's about whether we're still in the game a decade from now. But staying in the game means more than building fabs. It means regaining technological credibility. And Intel, for now, hasn't delivered that. And this isn't where it ends. Intel may be the first major casualty, but it's not the last. The real aim of Beijing's campaign is broader. China is now preparing export bans on critical materials like gallium and rare earths used in everything from AI training to aerospace, and further restrictions on chips for advanced machine learning. Washington is preparing a response. New restrictions, new alliances. But many are beginning to ask whether it's already too late. Because the real question isn't just whether Intel can recover, it's whether the United States 
the country that invented the semiconductor can maintain leadership in a global tech race that's now moving without